In this video, we will learn to name and identify the bones of the upper and lower appendages. We will learn about the types of joints found in the appendicular skeleton, and we will learn about the structures within these joints. The adult human skeletal system consists of 206 individual bones and all of the joints in between them. Bones are strong, rigid organs made mostly of a special type of connective tissue called osseous tissue. Osseous is a word that means related to bones. Bones serve many functions, including producing red and white blood cells in our bone marrow. Storing minerals, also called salts or ions, they protect some of our most important and delicate organs, and they provide the support and structure that our bodies need in order to be able to move. Interestingly, human infants possess more bones than human adults. Humans possess about 300 bones at birth, and their skeletons contain much more of a different, less rigid connective tissue called cartilage. Cartilage is different from bone tissue because cartilage is softer and more flexible. Additionally, cartilage does not possess a network of blood vessels, while bone tissue does. Over time, the non-vascular cartilage in the baby's skeleton develops into vascular bone tissue, and several of the baby's bones will fuse together. And this explains how humans start with 300 bones, but end up with only 206. The skeletal system is often divided into two different sections, the axial skeleton and the appendicular skeleton. The axial skeleton consists of the bones of the skull, the spine, and the rib cage. These are bones found along the vertical axis of the body. The appendicular skeleton consists of the bones of the arms and the legs, as well as the bones that connect the arms and the legs to the axial skeleton. The arms and legs are also referred to as appendages, which is where the appendicular skeleton gets its name. Next, let's investigate the anatomy of the upper appendages, or arms. The human arm is the upper appendage. It's specially adapted for throwing accuracy and for precise movement and manipulation. The upper arm is attached to the rib cage by two bones, the scapula and the clavicle. The scapula, sometimes called the shoulder blade, is a flat, triangular bone found on the back of the upper torso. The clavicle is sometimes called the collarbone, and it's an S-shaped bone located near the base of the neck. The scapula is actually not attached to the bones of the back, but instead floats above them. The scapula is attached to the torso by its connection with the clavicle. The scapula is also attached to the bone of the upper arm, called the humerus. The humerus extends from the shoulder to the elbow. The part of the arm found between the elbow and the wrist contains two long bones. The bone that extends from the elbow to the wrist on the side of the thumb is called the radius. The bone that extends from the elbow to the wrist on the side of the pinky finger is called the ulna. I like to remember the difference between these two bones by recalling that the pinky finger is the smallest of your four fingers and that the ulna is the shorter of the two names having only four letters. The bones of the wrist are called carpals. The name of these bones comes from the Greek and Latin words for wrist, which is carpos or carpus. There are eight small, irregularly shaped carpal bones in the wrist. The bones of the palm of the hand are called metacarpals. Meta is a word part that can mean next to or after, and we already know that carpal means wrist. 
The bones of the fingers are called phalanges. Each finger contains three phalanges, called proximal, which is another word for near, middle, and distal, which is another word for far. The thumb only contains two phalanges, a proximal phalanx and a distal phalanx. The word phalanx is the singular form of the word phalanges. Now we're familiar with the bones of the arm, from the scapula in our shoulder all the way to the farthest phalanx. Next, we will investigate the anatomy of the leg. Humans evolved over many millions of years to have specialized upper and lower appendages. Our distant ancestors were four-legged organisms called tetrapods, whose forelimbs were nearly identical to the hind limbs. We can see this evolutionary history reflected in the fact that the bones of the human arm are homologous to the bones of the human leg. This means that the arms and the legs have bones in similar arrangements, even though our arms and legs carry out different functions. The scapula and clavicle are sometimes referred to as the shoulder girdle or the pectoral girdle. The pelvic bones carry out a similar function in the lower appendages and are also sometimes called the pelvic girdle. The pelvic bones are two large irregular flat bones with a shape that reminds some people of a human ear. The upper part of the pelvic bone is called the ileum. You might be able to feel your iliac crest if you press down on the upper outer part of your hips. The lower part of the pelvic bone, the part you sit on, is called the ischium. The pelvic bones are attached at the hip joint to the femur. The femur is the largest, strongest bone in the human body. The femur plays a role similar to the humerus in the arm. It stretches from the hip to the knee. Like the lower part of the arm, the lower part of the leg possesses two bones. The larger of these two bones is called the tibia, and it's also sometimes referred to as the shin bone. The smaller bone found on the outer side of the lower leg is called the fibula. The knee joint possesses a bone that has no equivalent in the arm. In the front of the knee, there's a small round bone called the patella. We also sometimes call this bone the kneecap. The patella helps to make sure that our knee joint bends in one direction and not in the other. The tarsals in the foot are similar to the carpals in the wrist. The tarsals are seven irregularly shaped bones that make up the ankle, the heel, and the proximal part of the foot. Extending from the tarsals, we find the metatarsals. These five long bones make up the main part of the arch of each foot. At the end of the metatarsals are the phalanges. Just like your fingers, four of your toes possess three phalanges each, while the big toe only possesses two. These are all of the bones of our legs from our hips all the way down to our toes. Our bones provide support and structure to the body, but we couldn't move without the joints that are found between them. Joints are the connections between bones. There are three main types of joints in the human skeletal system. They are fibrous, cartilaginous, and synovial. Fibrous joints are generally found between bones that are in very close contact with each other, and these bones are connected by fibrous tissue. A cartilaginous joint is when two bones are joined by cartilage. Finally, synovial joints are freely moving joints. They are cushioned and lubricated by a special fluid called synovial fluid. Fibrous joints tend to be immovable joints. 
and cartilaginous joints can be immovable or slightly movable. Synovial joints are adapted to allow a wide range of motions. These are the most common type of joint found in your highly articulated or movable appendicular skeleton. This diagram shows a cross section of a simplified synovial joint. In yellow, we see the synovial cavity that is filled with synovial fluid. Synovial fluid is very slippery. It lubricates the joints and reduces friction. The ends of these bones would also be coated with a thin layer of articular cartilage. Articular cartilage also decreases friction within joints. The bones are attached to each other by fibrous organs called ligaments. Ligaments function to connect bones to other bones. Pictured in red, we see two muscles. The muscles are what cause the joint to move. When this upper muscle contracts, the joint will straighten. When this lower muscle contracts, the joint will bend further. The muscles are connected and anchored to the bone by a fibrous organ called a tendon. Tendons serve the function of connecting muscles to other body parts, often bones. Almost all of our most movable joints are synovial joints similar to this one. This includes our shoulders, hips, knees, elbows, wrists, and ankles. This also includes the joints between the phalanges in our fingers and the phalanges in our toes. The pivot joint in our neck and the hinge joint in our jaw are also examples of synovial joints. Now that we've learned about the bones of the appendicular skeleton, as well as the joints that connect them, let's try a practice question. Which bodily structure's bones are made up of the carpals, metacarpals, and phalanges? This question provides us with the names of three different sets of bones. And then it asks us to recall which bodily structure these bones belong to. Well, phalanges is the scientific name for the bones in our fingers and the bones in our toes. So we can narrow our answer choices down to either the hand or the foot. Here I've drawn a simplified diagram of the bones of the hand and the bones of the foot. We've already recalled that the fingers and toes are called phalanges. In the foot, the bones of the ankle and heel are called tarsals. And the bones of the arch of the foot are called metatarsals. While in the hand, the bones of the wrist are called carpals and the bones of the palm of the hand are called metacarpals. So the bodily structure that's bones are made up of the carpals, metacarpals, and phalanges are the hands. Let's wrap up our lesson by taking a moment to review what we've learned. In this video, we learned about the anatomy of the appendicular skeleton. We learned to name and identify the bones of the shoulder girdle, the pelvic girdle, the arm, the leg, the hand, and the foot. We learned about the structure of synovial joints, as well as the functions of tendons and ligaments. 